so much uh, that we get to be in this house that you have built, Lord, that your servants built uh, some 70 years ago. Father, as we look at this season and we look at our times, Lord, we know that we are here for such a time as this. Father, help us to reach out to our communities. Help us to think about those who are different from us, other from us, and those that we can help, those who are in need. Father, that's the people that you're always looking for. Each of us were needy at some point. We needed you. We needed your salvation. We needed your grace. And we needed so many things from you. Father, you still provide those things today through your son, Christ Jesus. As we listen to our speakers today, Father, we are very grateful. And Lord, uh, as we enter into our community, Lord, we ask for your blessing, Lord. And we ask for many to join us as we do. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen. amen. So, um, Brian Chandler's with us this morning from UGM, and I'm going to give him a full introduction, and Jennifer Liggett. Yay, Jennifer. And uh, so, as we start to kick off the holiday season, we have to remember that there are people that are tired, they're cold, they're hungry, they're ill. And they need help. Uh, they need assistance in uh, rehabilitation, uh, drug abuse, uh, substance abuse, alcohol, so many things. And during this season, I want to say is maybe one of the best times for us to focus on that. But believe it or not, it's an everyday, year-round focus. So this morning, as we get ready for the holiday season and we think about ways that we can help, I especially wanted to have Brian and Jennifer come and share with us today as we get ready for these things. And so, uh, as Brian and Sheila and I were talking uh, this morning, we were trying to remember how far back we actually go. And I didn't realize, uh, Brian, that you had just started at UGM when we met. And I want to say it was humble beginnings, but uh, man, they, they definitely, they tapped the right guy when they tapped you. And I've heard some incredible stories about you. And, can I just share one of them? And I don't know if it's true and you can confirm it or not. I think it was told by one of your sons because uh, um, I have to say that the Chandler family I know very well and even their grandchildren. And so it's been a blessing to really watch their boys grow up, their boys take wives and have children. And I want to say what an amazing uh, community uh, asset you are. You're increasing the population. <laughs> <laughs> but you're helping people every day. <laughs> um, so uh, I had heard that you were helping somebody. This was years ago, um, uh, and I think you were maybe downtown, and you were helping assist somebody, or maybe you were in one of the vans, and somebody took a shot at you, you know, and they, they hit you in the jaw, and it was like you just kind of shook it off, and it was like, hey, how can I help you? And uh, I don't know if that was actually true or not, but that's probably happened a few times. You just kind of roll off, and it's like, I'm here to help you. I'm not here to fight you. I'm here to help you. And so I don't know if that was a true story or not. You'll have to confirm that. Yeah, a long time ago. So it was a true story. Wow. And uh, your sons are incredible, too. I've worked with all of them, both in UGM and in ministry and throughout the community. And, uh, and your grandson, too, Jackson. Man. Uh, what an incredible young man he is and what a legacy that he's being raised up into. And so, so um, Brian Chandler and I, we go back a little ways, uh, probably some 13, 14 years at least, uh, when you just started with UGM and I had just uh, moved here to the Seattle area, crash landed from Jerusalem. I'd been back from Israel for about two years, came up here to the Northwest and uh, and I can remember some of the early tales that Brian would talk about, you know, in his ministry and it, just as he was feeling out UGM and he was there uh, and really instrumental in beginning the search and rescue ministry. And I want to say I was on that for years and years and I learned Seattle under the bridges helping people. And I want to thank UGM for that. Uh, we did... Uh, um, different journeys, uh, different programs with UGM through the years. Many of those people have become uh, endeared to us. Mohawk Mike, and uh, who was the other gentleman uh, that we were talking about? Richard. Richard. Yeah, Richard. Uh, and what a, what a story of redemption and recovery. Uh, just absolutely amazing. Um, 
and you've really seen a lot of journey with UGM and so what you do now. And so um, Brian is now, he is the Director of External Affairs and you really work with the city of Seattle now. Uh, you really talk to groups of people and throughout the area and I want to say what an incredible journey, you know, as you've been in the trenches uh, helping people, helping people help other people and creating those ministries and now you're out in Seattle and you're with city council, mayor's office, uh, so many different businesses and organizations that you help with and Brian, you and your family, you just continue to give and I want to say it's a big pleasure to have Brian Chandler with us this morning to share with us and talk to us about UGM. And I think you're gonna give us some time to ask some questions maybe. My hope is that there'll be those here, uh, either in our church or in our groups, uh, that are going to maybe go out on some daytime excursions, some daytime rescue missions, and some evening ones. And we'll show you Seattle in a way that uh, God helps people. And I wanna thank you for that. Uh, Please give Brian Chandler uh, and his wife, Sheila, a warm round of applause, uh, applause to the Lord. And I want to welcome you here, Brian. Such a blessing. We're going to get Brian uh, set up with a microphone, with a lapel microphone. This area has some pretty tall guys, but... Uh, <laughs> this guy's from Iowa, and uh, there, we have another... Uh, uh, Iowan here, and um, um, what's that? Same, same, same hometown. hometown, man. Small little community too. Man. The corn grows pretty high was, there, but the people it do too. It looked a little different when I was there than when he was there. <laughs> they were still in horse and buggy when he was living there. Oh my! <laughs> kind of stuck with wagons. Let's see if this is on for you. It is. I can hear my own voice. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, it's great to be here. There are a lot of stories over the years, some good. You know, my, <clears throat> I, uh, I give a lot of stuff away. And so it was tough for my wife because she'd buy me a new coat and I'd give it away. She'd buy me new shoes, I'd give it away. <clears throat> when I was the director of the men's ministries downtown, they would have me work in the Welcome Center but when people came in and wanted money or wanted things like that, I gave it to them. And uh, so I got kicked out of the Welcome Center <laughs> because of that. It's such a great joy to be here and to be able to speak to something that's obviously near and dear to my heart. I've been with the mission for almost 15 years. And uh, the mission's been around for 90 plus years, has a great reputation in our city and our state and even in our Senate. So I get to work with senators and legislators as well and sharing the gospel with them. And it's just amazing the opportunity that God gives me to be able to do that and to share with them what I'm gonna share with you. And it seems like, and I think Jennifer could say the same, and I'm so glad I'm going before Jennifer because she's so dynamic, I wouldn't wanna follow her. Um, she's amazing. Um, but changing the face and the perspective of homelessness is my job. That is my job now, is trying to communicate what the real issues are. And we in here know what the real issue is, and it's our heart. It's the heart issue. And trying to get to the core, our city and our state, and maybe even the world believe that homelessness is the problem, but it's not. It's so much deeper than that. And so I get an opportunity to share to you today, and we're gonna go quick because this is like an hour presentation and, uh, and I'm hungry already, so uh, that dictates much of what I do. Okay. <clears throat> Our mission Don't you love that little wheel? Well, he'll pull it up. I'm going to share it with you. Our mission is to bring the love of Jesus and hope, hope, hope for a new life to our homeless neighbors. That's our mission. Here's what I have come to understand about life and even for myself is this, is that you can go without water 
for three days. You can go without food for eight days, but you can't go a second without hope. Hope is what drives us. Hope is what gets us out of bed. Hope is what determines what we do in life. And so that's what we do. We help to give hope. How do we do that? Through our vision. Every homeless neighbor beloved, redeemed, and restored. Now, most every mission has the word redeemed and restored in their mission. But we added one word, beloved. Because we believe that that's where it starts. It starts with love. It starts with loving our neighbors. And Jesus made it very clear in his great commandment is that we are to love him with all of our heart, mind, and soul. And then what else? To love our neighbors. But not just love our neighbors. Love our neighbors, what? As ourselves. As ourselves. So the beautiful thing about this journey and the things that Jennifer and I get to do is that by helping other people and doing this, you know what happens? We begin to love ourselves a little bit more. God uses it to change our lives more than he uses it to change other people's lives. And it's amazing to see that work. Here's some, some statistics that seem, as you see them, are a little bit tragic, but the next one will reveal even more. In 2000. 22, the King County Regional Housing Authority did a one-night count in King County and found 13,368 people homeless on the streets of Seattle. So they did the count on one night, and that's how many they found in January 2022 on the streets of King County. The next slide, if you'll pull that first point up. So here's what the King County Regional Housing Authority has done. They have looked to the Washington Department of Commerce. What it is is if you sign up to get any kind of benefits whatsoever in the city of King County in Seattle, you go into a database. And inside of that database, when you sign up to get any kind of benefits whatsoever, you mark your status of your home. Are you homeless? Are you living in a shelter? Are you living, you know, wherever you are. They found in January of 2023 that 44,570 people marked that they were homeless. Wow, that's huge. That is huge. 44,000 people. Here's some other statistics. 8,646 of them were single parents. 2,440 were youth, 5,813 were families. Tragic. Here's the reason why we do what we do, because of relationship. We say this all the time, it's not a resource issue, it's a relationship issue. It isn't because you don't have a job, it's not because you lose your house, it's not because you lose somebody, it's not because of a divorce, it's not because of those things. Those things happen and create some things, but the problem is, is that if I lost all that, I would have somewhere to go. I could move in with Jackson. As a matter of fact, I'm tempted to move in with Jackson <laughs> all the time. But we have people, right? If we lost everything, we would have somebody that would say, hey, move in with me. I, I, I dare to say if it happened in here that somebody would open up their house to be able to do that. So the problem is really broken relationships. The people that are homeless have nobody for that reason. Now, some of it is because maybe they were the cause of the broken relationship, but I'm going to dare to tell you in the next couple slides that maybe it's a little different. And I don't think it was an accident that we were talking about the young people that experienced tragedy at the hands of somebody else. There is an ACE study. This ACE study lists these categories, abuse, physical, emotional, sexual, neglect, physical, and emotional, mental illness, and mothers treated violently, divorce, incarcerated relatives, and substance abuse. What this study does is it assigns one point per this category. This is what people experience up to the, before the age of 12 in their life. And what they say is if a child has experienced just 
four of these, there's a 36% chance that they will be homeless. Just four of the 10. When we do the statistics downtown, guess what? They range from eight to 10, and majority of them are at 10. They have experienced all of this before the age of 12. Before the age of 12. And it's a good majority of the people that we serve. So relationships. The sad part is, some of these people, as children, never had a chance. From the beginning. And the part that I share and the part that Jennifer shares is this about individuals. Is, is, is their story. It's their story. It's what they have faced in their life that has caused tragedy and trauma in their life. And you know what they think? They think it's their fault. They think they're to blame. And so they live their whole life thinking, it's my fault, I deserve everything I get, and they can't pull themselves out. They just can't. And so we work in relationship to help them experience what it's like to have a relationship that they should have had before the age of 12 in a different way. To love them the way they've never been loved, to care for them, to get hit in the face by a fist or a sandwich or a shoe, all of the above I've experienced, and to stay put and to not give up. Because I'm here today with a very high score, but I'm here today because God put people in my life that never gave up, including her, <laughs> my wife. Because people never gave up on me, I'm here today, and I get to do this great work. Because of time, Ben, let's bypass that first video. Let me show you with you real quickly how we do this. You'll see Johnny's story in a second. We have a couple different videos. How do we do this? How do we show the love? Let me go through this quickly. First of all, survival. Rod mentioned the outreach. It started the outreach department seven years ago before I stepped into this position. We're out on the streets uh, of Seattle during the day and at night. We're taking food and we use food, we use hygiene, we use all of these things to build a relationship in order to build trust. Once we build trust, then we begin sharing the love of Jesus, the whole process through, then we begin sharing, this is what we do, and this is how we can help you. So I'll walk through this with you. The first one is that survival. The, the outreach team, our search and rescue, we have a shower trailer, we have mental health, and we're taking this to the street every day. Guess what? You can too. You can sign up to go on the streets with our outreach team, and you get to see and to hear stories and to give your shoe away, to give your coat away, but to hear the stories and to hear the tragedy. But then you get an opportunity at that moment to share the love of Jesus in such a way that it changes their face. And ultimately, it changes their life. Because I share my story, and they say, man, if Brian can make it, anybody can make it. I say, boy, my wife would say amen to that. The next one is stabilization. This is through our shelters. We have enhanced shelters. We have work programs uh, that we can take people to immediately to get them off the street, to start working on resources and help them, help them get going, whether it's education, whether it's job, whether it's recovery. We have dental services, legal services. We talked, I, I talked to a gentleman back here about our prison ministries. We're in the prisons helping people. Then from there, they can go into our recovery programs. We have a men's recovery program. We have women's recovery programs. We have a dual diagnosis mental health and recovery program that is so needed right now, amen? The mental health, our mental health facility is full all the time um, dealing with those tragedies. And then once they complete our recovery programs, they go into a post-graduation where we have a department, an entire department devoted to what happens after they graduate. 
Our philosophy is this, it's that once you're with us, you're with us for, until you say you're not with us. So you can come back and you can get more counseling, you can come back and get food, you can come back and get furniture, you can come back and get help, you can come back and hang out, you can come back and share your story for life. And uh, it's a great program. Right now, we have a 66% success rate. That's five years out. Five years out. 66% of our graduates are still doing amazing in life. And a lot of it is because we connect them with churches like you. We connect the people that graduate into places such as this. And they get around you, and they go to the Bible studies, and they go to the prayers, and they, they do all this with you and walk alongside of you and to learn how to do life different, and to learn from you. Here's our impact so far. This is from January till today. I just ran these stats. We have provided 308,000 meals. Whew. Thank you, Dean Way, our illustrious cook. Next one. 425 professions of faith. Whoo, isn't that credible? 425 people came to Jesus because of our ministries. 194 people came off the streets. We provided 1,133 bed nights. 60 recovery graduates. 7,342 unique legal issues were handled and 440, 405, 53 dental visits. How much time do we have? It's almost 12 o'clock already, isn't it? Take your time. <laughs> I want to share this story. I, I, watch this video. This is a result of what we do. I was happy to be out of the tent. I was willing to do anything they told me to do, so I did not go back to the tent. I started to feel like a person again. There was hope. So I would go visit her every day. I would see like her rise, you know, and how much she was just like, like becoming a woman, you know, right before her very eyes. And I remember sitting there and as she's sharing the, you know, the word of God and sharing the, sharing the program with me and this and that, you know, it was thinking to myself like, dude, I want some like core brothers, you know, and I want, I want like, some case management, you know, I would like, like, you know, to have a devotion. My first 30 days of the mission was like, it was, it was, it was, it was beautiful and it was gut-wrenching to me and it was um, probably the greatest moments of my life. God called me here for a purpose. He was going to make a way, but my way he gave to me through Hope Place. I had made these big signs and <laughs> had everybody sign them. Because to me it was like welcome home to your mother kind of thing. I was learning how to be a mom all over again. A whole bunch of people were just like congratulating me and my mom on finally moving in together. I love Johnny now. He's the dad I don't have. I mean he really is because he's my stepdad but I'm just glad Johnny is here because I don't know what we would have done without him. I'm not just a drug addict, a person without a house. I'm, I, I matter, I'm somebody. I'm an individual in my life that, you know, someone cares about. The beauty of it is we keep going, we keep pushing forward, and we just, and it keeps working. We are family! It does not work without God. Like, there is no future, there is no hope. There is, if I'm not putting God first, there's, all these things cannot be possible. Great job. Yeah, right? <laughs> oh man, that's why I don't like showing that video. It gets me every time walking with Johnny and Steph through this time and Steph losing her children because of drugs and because of addictions and seeing what God did while they were at the mission. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is why I get up every day because I get to be a part of what happens with Johnny and Steph and Paris and those families. So seeing that 
is amazing. And it proves to me every day that we don't just have a God. We have an amazing God who never gives up, who loves beyond reason. And we get to share that. And it's amazing to me. Well, here's your part right here, getting involved. How can you get involved? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> There's a number of ways that you can get involved. We have a program called BAM. It's a bring a meal. So you even as a church could say, hey, we want to give a meal. We actually have a Kent Hope, which is right down the street uh, from you on Central. You could bring a meal over there as a church, or you could go and to serve there. Uh, we talked about uh, search and rescue and being involved in search and rescue, and I think Rod has already signed you all up. Uh, he said he would ask for forgiveness later, um, so I'll let him handle that. And, and then prayer. Uh, we, we talked about it this morning, and I so appreciate what was said this morning about prayer. We need it. We need prayer, and, uh, and it works, and we see it. Um, and then mentoring, we have some programs with our men and women where you could actually mentor a man or a woman coming out of our program and uh, just take them under your wing. And a lot of people will just go and have coffee uh, once a week with one of them and, and just share life, and it's amazing. And then we have a lot of classes that you could teach as well in all of our programs, whether it's a woman's program, men's program, or children. And so you can get involved in that way as well. And um, that is it. We have one more video I'm going to end with that talks about and shows a little bit about our search and rescue. It shows what we do as a whole. So enjoy this and then uh, Jennifer's up. Find you in the middle of the darkest night is true. 
recognize about four or five faces that are up there mm. and I have to say I'm just moved I know the people that were moved by this ministry mm -hmm. and uh, you are all signed up so just know it and, <laughs> and but there's always something we can do especially pray but uh, I think Leslie and I we're gonna go uh, maybe on some search and rescue missions and we're gonna invite people to come with us as we go out and we serve those in this community mm. right. uh, there's a few faces on there I know those people personally, and I've served with them in ministry, watching what God has done. This is truly kingdom work. Mm -hmm. And uh, this time, uh, I'd like, uh, Brian, maybe to answer a few questions. Sure. Or questions or comments that you might have. Pam, go ahead.
Thanks for sharing. Yeah, it's uh, it's good. I mean, it, it, it's uh, that's the other piece of that hope is, you know, like we just saw with Johnny and Steph and the family coming back together and, you know, working with so many parents um, on a regular basis uh, that have stories like yours. And some were unfortunate. Um, Good. Thank you. Yeah. Hmm. Any more questions? Man, thank you so much for Yeah, thanks. Yeah, God bless you. Yeah. We're going to give a uh, special donation from our congregation to uh, UGM. And then we also um, have another speaker that's coming up here, Jennifer Liggett. And she's going to share with us about what we can do. Both of these are local ministries. And uh, my only regret is that more people don't hear your message, more people in our communities, you know, and see the actual work that you do. Because I knew five people in the video. I've known them, and I've, I've watched them come up and through your ministry and, of course, Pam's son. Uh, it's amazing what you do uh, for the kingdom of God and for Christ. It is amazing. You guys are the hands of God. Uh, I'm so thankful that you're here in this community. How about one more praise offering to the Lord for UGM? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Jennifer Liggett uh, if she'll come up. And I want to say this young lady, and I can say that because I'm like 61 now, right? <laughs> Forever young. Um, she's going to come up and she's going to share about the storehouse and I want to say the storehouse ministry, um, I wasn't here in the beginning of that, but I knew the founding director who began that, May Holland. And I want to say it was an incredible thing, and we just didn't have anything like that in our community, uh, not anything like a storehouse or the resources. And Jennifer has been absolutely incredible. She, you are the third director? Man. And I want to say what an incredible person Jennifer is. Uh, you were president of the Chamber of Commerce here. You pretty much single-handedly saved it. <laughs> and uh, But for the storehouse, you have just brought so many programs, so many resources, and that's something that we donate to. Many of our communities donate to that as well, and it's an ongoing thing. And as we come into this season, we come into a season of food scarcity. So I don't want to steal the spotlight from the executive director uh, of the storehouse. I want to introduce to you now, Jennifer Liggett. Jennifer? Do you have it ready? I'm not sure. Um, ben, if we have the video ready, we'll go ahead and show that. Let's show that first. Sorry. Yeah. I, was, I was not trying to trip you. Oh, that's all right. I get and it's really all stuck. Okay, now step over. <laughs> we could limbo, but I we think it's not going to work out, I don't think. <laughs> We may be the only light that they see this week. Food is medicine and food is health. Look at each person that comes through with love and care and they're going through something. Whatever they're going through, we're here for them. We need to have food available, accessible, and available with dignity to all members of our community. That's what the storehouse is all about. When I heard about the storehouse, I was in a very unique situation. I was a stay-at-home mom with three teenagers, and my husband left. I was not aware that the storehouse was a resource available. A friend of mine told me about the storehouse. I signed up, and it was 
such a great day when Saturday morning would come twice a month and a box of food would be on my porch and there was no questions asked and there was no judgment and I was very thankful for that. When you live in King County, it's very hard to go hungry and people say, well, everybody can get food wherever they want to, but the problem is, is that we live with a lot of guilt and shame in our life. And guilt and shame keep us from going to places to get food. And so people go to places where they don't have to deal with their guilt. They don't have to deal with their shame, that they're loved and they're accepted and there's no judgment. You know, we've seen families come that tell us that if it weren't for the food that we provide, they probably couldn't pay their rent or they wouldn't have money for their gas. So we give them that resource. If you really care, then you're going to share. And whether you share your time, whether you share your money, whether you just share your enthusiasm about how Storehouse takes care of this community, I would ask you to do that. They can do it online. They can, you know, we have some donors that give monthly. As we get donations into the storehouse from individuals and corporations and businesses, we're able to then take that money to go purchase meat and eggs and milk and diapers. That's a, that's a big one. And also personal hygiene items that are needed by all our clients. Covington has a food bank. Covington has a food bank for everybody. And many of the volunteers are past recipients, like myself. Whether you're here to volunteer, whether you're here to donate, to tell others about it, or to use our services, we're here for you. There's no judgment, and everybody here will greet you with a smile. It's a safe place to come to with a lot of love. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your neighbors. Come join us. Well, thanks for having me back here, you guys. I think it's been like a year, I'm pretty sure, because we didn't have our video, I know that, and we weren't in a shopping model yet, and I think I um, took Rabbi Rod's sermon away that day. So I'm going to talk fast this time. <laughs> Um, but I, I just want to thank you for allowing me into your space today um, to share a little bit about the storehouse. And um, Brian, thank you so much for your presentation about Union Gospel Mission because uh, food doesn't discriminate. We don't either. Just like homelessness, it doesn't discriminate. So, um, And as you shared about your son, you know, we just want to meet people where they're at. And that's the same for the storehouse. So we're not going to ask questions. We're going to meet you where you're at. And if you're willing to share information with us, we're fully able to engulf in helping you and surround you. Um, we have recently developed four core values, um, which is phenomenal because now we can wrap every decision around these core values. Um, and we're really working on just driving our, our mission and vision home in every action that we take. Um, and so our core values are stewardship, dignity, compassion, and community. So everything we do needs to revolve around those things. Um, and just as Brian said, we are huge advocates with our legislators, senators, local representatives, making sure that they know what's going on and really going on in our community. Um, it's far past just a table talk conversation. So I believe everybody in this room has been impacted in food insecurity in one way or another, whether it was for a week, a year, a lifetime, and the same goes with homelessness. There's always going to be a point in your life where it could be, I need to move and I don't know how I'm going to pay the deposit, the first and the last. I just experienced that this month. So a, qu a quick update on me, and then for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Jennifer. I'm a single mother of five. I have a five-year-old, six-year-old, eight-year-old, 17-year-old, and 19-year-old. And my eight-year-old um, has some mental health issues that we are um, working with a wonderful team on. But when I see videos like Union Gospel Mission and I know her ACE score, um, and when I talk with her and she says that she has the hardest time feeling happy and the easiest time feeling hopeless. 
at age eight. It just put me on this path of this is really impacting my life as well. And this, this is me being completely transparent with you guys. Um, so it impacts all of us. And then it, you wonder, what life will this child have if we don't do early intervention? If we don't build and maintain those positive relationships, could she be at the food bank? Could she be on the streets? You know, there's so many different options. And so just like food doesn't discriminate, homelessness doesn't either. My ACE score is a nine. So I know I can probably re relate to Brian in this. Um, I think also because of these high ACE scores, as long as we have those relationships built around us that can help us, they can't save us, right? Only God can do that. Um, but they can help us build a happy, healthy, firm foundation um, and have, have us build a successful life and further relationships. So... Um, for the storehouse, I have a near, it, it's near and dear to my heart, and it was a, definitely a godsend when that came my way that Liesl, the executive director, was moving to Eastern Washington, and I was sitting here thinking, I'm ready for this new transition, and the storehouse was also ready for a new transition, so it was this perfect God marriage that said, you are supposed to be here right now. Um, and I came in right after um, the, the COVID restrictions had, had ended and we were kind of transitioning. And so last time I was here, we talked about how we were still doing food in boxes for people and that the goal, I remember sharing that the goal was that we were going to move to an in-store shopping model. And many reasons were for that, but number one was one of our core values, which is dignity. So we want our clients and customers uh, our neighbors and friends to be able to come in and come to the storehouse and believe that they came to a grocery store. Because when I was younger, and I may have shared this with you before, but when I was younger, I was a food bank child. And um, anytime it was referred to as a food bank, in my head, I, I was at the food bank. I mean, I was five years old, right, at the food bank. And so when people would say at school, where did you get that, whatever it was in my lunch, I would say, well, the food bank. And then what would, what would happen after that? You're made fun of, right? And so what saved me in that was this elderly gentleman that met me every Monday at the food bank, and he would say, thank you for coming to my grocery store today. And that impacted me so much that I will never forget this man's face because every Monday he told me, thank you for visiting me at the grocery store. And so that is something that um, I have talked with our volunteers at the food bank about is, yes, historically known as a food bank, and yes, we get our grants based on the fact that we're a food bank, but to our community, we should be another grocery store. So just like you go to Safeway or Fred Meyer, please help your neighbors understand that they're just going to a grocery store. We have eggs and milk and butter and cheese and bread just like a grocery store. One thing we're not, though, is your primary source of food. And the reason is because we don't have every food category. And we also don't have all the foods that culturally would respond to your lifestyle. So we are a bridge. And that's as best as we can do. And we're going to do that really well. So when you come to the food bank, we suggest that you would come there, get all the items on your shopping list that you're looking for, and then use your EBT card or your SNAP benefits, whatever benefits you might have, to go and purchase the other items you may need from the store. Or maybe you're in a transitional moment where you don't qualify for any other benefits through the state, but you just need a little bit extra help. So you get to come and see us we're happy to help you during this time, and we're happy to help you find ways to give back when you're out of that time. That's not something that is required of you, but we're happy to be there in a full circle, holistic experience. We have a large group of senior individuals who are coming to the food bank, and so I wanna talk about that today because we all have a friend, neighbor, or relative who's maybe hinted at being food insecure. And just as I said before, it doesn't discriminate. And we have a lot of benefits that are remaining stagnant for seniors 
Well, inflation costs are rising, which means there's a deficit of things available to you. And that might mean that you're slightly struggling with paying your rent or your mortgage or your gas. And we don't ever want our seniors to have to choose. And what we have found is silent hunger. So our seniors are just reducing the amount of food they're eating, thus inevitably choosing to starve themselves in order to pay their utility bill. But there's so many options. But the number one thing that comes to light is shame. And we don't want any of our community members to feel shame. We're your friends at the food bank. We're your friends at Union Gospel Mission. We are your army, and I'm proud to be part of Union Gospel Mission's army because we're that step up. And once Union Gospel Mission can help even our homeless friends or unhoused friends, however that they identify as, move into this transitional housing, next steps come into place and we get to be one of them. But not just from our homeless population, but for our seniors as well, our young couples. It's really important that you can talk with your friends your family and your relatives to say, I'm struggling a little bit, but I do know there's a resource. Would you come with me to the food bank? And let me tell you, our check-in crew is very in tune with subtle hints. So the other day we had a senior come with another senior and they were neighbors at Affinity and the one senior came up and as soon as she started filling out her application, the other senior did not need to fill out her application, but she did anyway. And then she wrote across the top, I'm just here as an emotional support for my friend, please don't t submit this. And that was like the sweetest thing we could have ever seen come through and they both went shopping together. And then the next day, the other senior turned around and redonated the food that she <laughs> had gotten. We said, you didn't need to do that, but it was so sweet. But that really shows you this faith in humanity that we really, truly care for those around us. And just find a way to talk to that friend of yours. We're also seeing a huge influx of um, clients that are maybe around age 20. They might be young with a new baby and they're married, they're not married, we don't know, we don't ask questions. Um, but unfortunately, there's not enough education for them at maybe the high school level on how to do family planning or how to balance a checkbook, how to interview. When you think about those things, a lot of those programs are offered to students in after school programs such as DECA or FBLA or all the different acronyms of things that you can do after school. But if you think think about those after school programs, that child has to have a way home, right? So the children who are lower income ride the bus to school and home. They can't afford to stay after school for even the additional free programs where they would learn more about life and things that happen or job opportunities. So we have this gap where these items or these classes or these programs are being offered to our students, but they're not being offered maybe during school to the children that maybe need that more and that don't have another opportunity to get it. So then we're seeing more students come through our food bank line because they just don't know how else to acquire food or they didn't know they could apply for um, funding or money elsewhere through the state, so we help guide them through that. One thing I want to bring home is that we are a food bank and we are a food bank only. And I don't mean that negatively. I don't mean we're not going to assist you in other areas, but I believe that we, we can get lost if we try to do too many things. So if we can wrap ourselves around what we do really, really well and then build, just as the video said, an army around us of others who are doing things really, really well, then we have this really well-built community that's raising and bringing up these individuals who can see clearly, who know where to go to get resources, who know that they can go to the storehouse to get food, who know that if they have a friend struggling with suicide, they can call the suicide hotline, they could go to their doctor, they can go to their school nurse, if they're struggling with insecurities in the home, whatever that may be, whether it's housing, 
utilities. They can also contact Union Gospel Mission. They can contact Vine Maple Place, Praise Alleluia, Adult and Teen Challenge, so many different opportunities. So a lot of people will look at a community that has a lot of those things and think, wow, they must have a lot of uh, issues. There must be a lot going on in Seattle to make it be that way. But in reality, if you flip the script and you look at what's really happening, how blessed are we that God has provided us so many opportunities to help save people, help people, guide people, educate people, and just relationally love them. Well, how amazing it is that our community has these opportunities. So I didn't want to go in today about the who we are and what we do, because I definitely did that last time <laughs> far too long, and I figured our video summed it up. Um, but I just want you to know that we have a food bank you don't have to show us your income statements. You don't have to show us where you live. You don't have to tell us anything. You can come and you can write your name on your intake, intake form and you can leave it at that. You can come and get food. You can bring a friend. You can tell people about it. You can ask us how to get free cell phones. You can ask us about help with paying your utilities. You can ask us about housing opportunities. We have a binder. We can assist you. We can connect you. And we can help you feel more secure, whether that's with food or other, other resources. For Christmas, because I know you're all wondering, how can I get involved and how can I help? Now, when we, when we talked about this last time, your co congregation here stepped up in mighty ways, and it was such a blessing to have you all with us. Many of you came and volunteered. Many of you donated financially. I know every single one of you prayed for us. And our holiday season was a blessing to our community. And every single community member that comes to the storehouse got to have a gift card and presents so that they could shop with dignity, they could purchase their own food, they could make sure it was culturally responsive. So this year we're doing the same thing. We're going to make sure that our clients, which are our best friends, get to come and get a gift card for Thanksgiving and Christmas to purchase their own holiday meals. And I always add a caveat. They don't judge you for what you get in line at the grocery store, and we don't judge them for what they get. I always say, if I want Oreos and nachos, I'm getting them. And the person behind me shouldn't be judging me for those or how I chose to pay for those. And then I won't do the same thing for you when you get those items. So, because a lot of people wonder, what are they going to buy with the gift card that you're giving them? I don't care. I don't care what they're buying with the gift card. We blessed them with a gift card, and they're going to use it however they deem necessary. So my ask this holiday season is that you pray for our clients and our organization. That's number one, just constant prayer, because we have people being saved every day, and we have people who are finding a job every day or finding housing every day. So just pray for that continued relief for our clients, friends, family, and neighbors. And number two is, do you know anybody who would be interested in partnering with us for those $50 gift cards to QFC or Safeway, Walmart, Fred Meyer, all the above? And number three is, if you're so inclined to come and, and visit us, we would love to have you volunteer with us this holiday season and beyond. And I thank you for allowing me to be here today. And we match. Man, we do. Look at this. I'm going to say there's a lot of black and orange in the room. <laughs> and look, oh, we go with all the decoration as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Reverend. Oh, you bet. Man, what a blessing. You can see the work that God is doing both through UGM and uh, through the storehouse. There's a network of things that are happening. Uh, there's cake in the back, and I thank you so much. Uh, cake in the back and pie. Uh, please help yourself. There's coffee as well, and I'm going to close out our service. If you'd like to talk to our speakers afterward, and I think we might have, we're going to have an offering for UGM uh, later. We're going to put a check together for them, and I think there's actually some stuff for Jennifer as well for her to take with her as well. And so um, let's just get ready to stand and close out the service, and so I'm going to pray and then do the benediction. I guess we can probably do both. Father, I thank you so much that um, 
this community is blessed with the resources that we have, and we can see there's plenty of room for more. Lord, to make room for uh, new faces, Lord, uh, create new opportunities for ministry. The fields are white unto the harvest, Lord, but the laborers are few. We pray for those laborers. We pray for people who are interested, Lord, in helping those who need your help. Father, I thank you so much, and I pray for Union Gospel Mission, that you will just prosper them and everything that they need, it will be on their plate. Everything that Brian needs or they envision, Lord, that you've already made provision for that. And I pray that for Jennifer as well, especially in these seasons, Lord, when people look to you for hope. Lord, that hope is returned. And so, Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for their ministries and sharing with them. And, Father, as we go out, may we think about the things that we can do, Lord, to help this community. Father, again, uh, we uh, bless you, praise you. And, Father, as we leave today, may we go out with your blessing to serve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Please.